Good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning. How are you today? Can you have enough of those? How do you like God's coloring book out there? I like how Jamie done the, the children's sermonette out there and was talking about God's, uh, basically the coloring book of our lives and, and, uh, and how we fill in and he fills in. Uh, but it's just so wonderful to have that cool, crisp breeze a little bit this morning and just what a perfect day. So I'll have that cup of coffee on the front porch. But uh, we're here this morning. We're inside these walls. We're in God's house. Amen. Amen. And uh, we've got a couple new songs for you that we're going to play. But let's start off with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this day. For this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us be glad and rejoice in it. And Father, as Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians, Father, that... Uh, that we are all joined, we are a body, we are the body because we are bound by Jesus. And Father, because he paid the ultimate price. And Father, that if any one of our brothers and sisters, or Father, not even our brothers and sisters, anybody outside, that uh, Father, that we know that is in uh, turmoil, Father, we're to be that mouth, ears, eyes, and maybe Father, just the ears to listen. And Father, we thank you for what you do, Father, as you, Father, orchestrate this days for us that's coming up, Father, for the days laying ahead that the one day when that eastern sky is split open. But Father, right now we're alive and breathing through you as a song we're going to sing in a minute. Father, we thank you. Father, we ask that you give Pastor Jeff and Father, anybody that uh, Father needs that little message, Father, they're the big message to go right to their heart, Father, to stick in it here. Father, may it do it. And Father, we ask a special blessing to put our shut-ins. And Father, our country, Father, as we are kind of in turmoil still, but Father, as we witness to people and say, you know, we know that God's in control. And that's all we got to remember. You're in control. Your son, sweet Jesus' name. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen. Let's sing this song to him. We're alive and breathing. And uh, um, hold this in our heart, this song, alive and breathing.
Sometimes during the week I wake up and I get ready to go to work and I just feel like, oh, you know, I almost feel like I'm dragging myself out of the grave. But uh, this song is all about when God calls us, how do we react? And, uh, we've all been there where we've, where we've been distanced from God and uh, this is our chance this morning. I just ask you to just run out of that grave with us this morning, Lord, and uh, just uh, sing, this, sing this with us. Amen.
Thank you, Lord. We'll get started here just in a second. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. The unofficial end of summer. Wow. It just seems incredible, doesn't it? The summer has just kind of flown by and we are in the fall. I let the dogs out this morning. I'll be tight. It was a little chilly. Like it must it must be fall. As we start this morning, just a couple of quick announcements. First of all, I've, I've gotten some good feedback from the Dining Room Devos. If you've had a chance to watch them, I hope that you've enjoyed them. We have not been sending out uh, emails every time those have been released, just because I don't want to fill your inbox if it's not something that you're taking advantage of. But if you would like to be on an email list for that, please send me an email or a text and let me know. I don't want that to necessarily go out on our whole prayer request. Uh, list, but if you would like those reminders, please let me know. I'm happy to uh, let you know uh, when a new video has gone up, uh, which is every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 11 a.m., even tomorrow on Labor Day. Uh, there'll be another video coming out, but as we're walking through First Peter, I hope if you had a chance to watch those videos, you're finding them encouraging. Next Sunday is an, an exciting Sunday. Pray for good weather, because we're going to be at the park for worship next uh, Sunday morning. Uh, and that's going to be at 10 o'clock. And like we did last uh, in, in June, when we had our worship at the park, please bring a bag chair uh, to sit in or a picnic blanket if you'd like. Uh, or you can sit in the, uh, if you want to sit under the uh, picnic shelter there at the wooden tables, you're welcome to do that. Or if you sit, even want to just sit in the parking lot uh, there on the uh, east end of the park, you're welcome to do that. You should be able to hear things. Uh, as well. There will be a meal afterward that will be in the indoor pavilion. However, if you'd rather, just because of social distancing, if you'd rather take things outside, uh, there'll be a place for you to sit outside too if you want to sit uh, with your family and you need a meal out there. So um, if you have any more questions about that, you can, uh, there's a, a letter that you should have gotten a couple weeks ago that explains all that. It's also available uh, at the website. You can just download that, that letter uh, or let me know if you have any questions about that. And then also, I talked about this last week, but I think every parent that's here has gotten this, uh, this book. We're going to be uh, looking at this book called Mama Bear Apologetics, which is helping your kids understand how they can discern truth, how as parents we can uh, defend our children from some of the lies that are being told by the world. And uh, my goal is that we'll start sending out emails to parents uh, with some of just some discussion about what's in this book. But uh, I've started to read a little bit into it. I'm, I'm excited about this book. I've always been a big fan of apologetics. But the thing about which, if you haven't, if you're not familiar with apologetics, it simply means defending the faith. It's from the Greek word apologia, which means explanation. It's explaining why we believe in Jesus Christ. And and so, but it's kind of a, a, a subject that if you're not trained in it, it can get kind of confusing. This puts it in everyday language that helps parents understand. When kids are exposed to different teachings and philosophies in the world, it helps parents understand how they can teach their kids why that's false and how to walk in the light of God's word. And so I'm looking forward to uh, hopefully parents uh, reading through that and being able to encourage parents with that. So I believe that's the only announcements that I have right now, so I think we are ready for our children's message. garments to wear. Um, these are some things that we have in our dress-up bucket, and you can see up here, you know, 
we can have a lot of different things in our dress up buckets. And I know that we have everything from doctor's costumes to, well, octopus heads and ninja warrior kind of stuff. We, I think we have Darth Vader, right? Some stormtrooper stuff in there. We have a little bit of everything at our house. And the clothes in our dress-up boxes can need sleeves rolled up and hems pinned, but today's verse tells us about the clothes that God gives us. We're clothed with garments of salvation designed to fit us perfectly. Salvation is something we could never wear if it wasn't designed by God. When we wear God's salvation, we aren't dressed for a pretend event, but something real to spend forever in heaven. And I know Eva has had fun dressing up Aaron as a, as a ballerina, right? Isn't that sometimes fun? That's why I can do that skirt, Aaron. Aaron, are you ever going to be a ballerina? No. Eva, are you ever going to be a ninja or a warrior or a Jedi? Probably not, right? But it's fun to think about and pretend. And this doesn't fit you, does it? Does the Jedi robe fit you? A little too small, but you have you definitely had clothes that are too big, right? We've had to pin and tuck together. We've been we've been on both sides of that. <laughs> so here's what I want you guys to think about this week. As you get dressed, I want you to say this quick prayer. May we be faithful in serving you today. We thank you for the salvation that you give. Okay, because our salvation fits us perfectly, not like our goofy dress up clothes. Do you guys remember what salvation is? Do you remember what salvation is, Eva? What is it? Am I putting you on the spot? That we're saved and we get to go to heaven. And God made that gift just for you. Even when you're dressed up like an angel. All right, guys, thank you for your help. We got three new students um, between Monday and Tuesday, and that's a lot. Um, I thought that going into the year we were going to have smaller numbers and that I would really get to cultivate these relationships with a smaller number of students, and man, let me tell you, like, it is just growing like crazy. We have, we got three new students this week. We have another one starting on Tuesday, and while I love it, I really kind of miss the days when it was just the eight of us in the morning or the eight of us in the afternoon because I really enjoy getting to know those kiddos. Um, and it's helpful because I can use those kids now as um, to help me to be leaders because they know the routine now. Um, but one thing that this week, it was just full of entertainment. Um, when you hang out with four-year-olds for a living, your whole life is just entertainment. Um, but this week, one of the little boys came up to me, and let me let me preface this by saying that it was one of the days that I was like putting out fires all day long. Do you have your mask on? Are you doing what you're supposed to do? Oh, let's not put our hands in our mouth. Let's not put our hands in our nose, right? Like just all of those different things that I say all day long. Um, and one little boy came up to me as I was ushering and trying to herd them into line so we could go out and I could get them right home. Uh, a little boy came up to me and he pulled on my on my shirt. He's like, Hey, Mrs. Long, Mrs. Long. I was like, hold on, buddy, I'm trying to get everybody in line. He goes, no, Mrs. Long. And I was like, yeah, buddy, what do you need? And he goes, uh, thank you for letting me come to school today. Oh, <laughs> and I was like, of course, you know? And um, I don't know when the last time was that I thanked God for letting me come to church, for letting me be with my church family. Um, I don't know that, I mean, I know we, we, we pray that and we thank him for the things of every day, but this little boy, really, really thought that I just let him come to school that day. Um, and he wanted, he had fun, and he wanted to tell me thank you. And I think that um, in our world, we see so much ungratefulness that to be thankful for something so small and something that really I had no control of, like I couldn't say, well, let's keep him home today. <laughs> I'm not going to do that, right? But um, it was just really interesting to me. And I was thinking about as we head into a new season of fall and how a lot of times we associate fall with thankfulness because Thanksgiving is in fall, that it's not going to hurt any of us to spend a little bit of extra time this fall being thankful. 
and showing thankfulness for the things that we have because I know that it's been a really rough year and I know that we have so much that we could gripe about. But me and we have so much to be thankful for. And so I just wanted to share that with you this morning because it really struck me um, and kind of set the tone for the rest of my week. And um, it was good. And hopefully Bonnie had a good time too. She was a substitute for me this week. So um, it's nice to have somebody that I know to be a substitute. So anyway, um, does anyone have any announcements or prayer concerns this morning? birthdays. We have one lady here with us today, and Jonathan was yesterday, and uh, Nick Stumps, and your mom, she's a Tuesday. Yeah. So I think we should sing happy birthday to her. Yeah. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. join with me in prayer. Lord, we thank you. We thank you that you let us come to church today. We thank you, God, that we can be together as a church family. We know that there are things going on in our in our lives, in our world, that everyone we encounter is, is fighting a battle that we don't know about. But Lord, we, we just thank you that you brought each and every one of us here this morning to be together, 
to worship you, to hear your message, and, and to cling to the fact that you are who you say you are. We thank you for that. Father, this morning we ask that you would continue to be with Lucy. Lord, we are so grateful that she is doing well. We are so grateful that she is home, and we thank you for the work that you are doing through her and through Laura, and we just continue to lift them up to you, Father. Lord, we ask that you would um, be with Doyle and that you would help him to feel better, um, that you would help the doctors or whoever to identify the cause of him not feeling well and be able to make it better, Father. Lord, this morning we lift up to you Shauna and her daughter, um, and we just pray that you would continue to be with her as she prepares to um, give birth. We pray that the baby would um, stay in as long as it needs to, Father. And we just pray for those who are treating her and giving them wisdom and discernment and the best things for her and for the child. Lord, we rejoice with the ESAP. We rejoice that Jonathan is um, celebrating a 17th birthday that is much, much better than his 16th, Father. We thank you that he is able to, to walk. We thank you for your healing. We thank you for the things that you are doing in his life because we know that they are great things and that you have great plans for him. And so we just continue to lift him up to you. Father, we also thank you that uh, April's Uncle Mike is, is doing better, that he is COVID-free, that he is um, able to be moved to this facility to help him. And Lord, we just thank you for your provision. We thank you for your healing that you did in his life. And Lord, we ask that you would be with Gracie's friends um, who are both on oxygen now all the time. We just lift them up to you. We pray that you would be with those who are treating them, that you would give them wisdom. We pray, Father, that you would be with her friends, that you would give them hope and patience and, and a time that can be so frustrating for them. We just lift them up to you and we pray that as Gracie talks to them, that you would give her the words to say um, that reflect who you are. And we thank you for her and who she is, Father. And Lord, we just ask that you would be with Sheila, that you would continue to be with her as she is trying to get over this cough this bad cough, Father. We just lift up her up to you and those who are treating her um, as they figure, try to figure out what, what to do to help her. Lord, we just ask that you would be with Pastor Jeff this morning as he brings a message that you would be with us as we listen, that you would help our, our hearts and our minds and our eyes to be open and alert and awake to what it is that, that you are saying through him this morning. And Father, we thank you for this place. We thank you for this building where we can come, where we can gather, where we can share, where we can feel your presence and your love shining on us. It's in your precious and holy name that we pray. Amen. The scripture this morning comes from the book of Luke. It is chapter 10, verses 1 through 2. And it says, After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him, to every town and place where he was about to go. He told them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into the harvest field. Let's stand and give glory to God as we sing, crown him with many crowns. Thank <laughs>
these songs that just tend to make you emotional when you hear them? Songs that every time you hear them, they just kind of overcome you a little bit. There's a Christian rock band, worship band, really, called Delirious that was uh, popular uh, 15, 20 years ago. Uh, and they have some incredible worship music you would recognize. You've probably sung some of their songs here. Martin Smith is their uh, head writer, their lead singer. And they just, every time I listen to Delirious, I, I feel like I'm in the presence of God. They just have that gift of leading you into the throne room. And there's a song that they sing that's off of their Glow album called uh, God, You Are My God. And it is just an incredible, it's at the beginning of the album, and it just uh, brings you right into the presence of God. It's really uh, kind of their take on, on Psalm 63. And musically, it's just wonderful. It, it begins with Benedictine monks chanting uh, Psalm 63 in Latin. And uh, it has them interwoven throughout. There's a gospel choir that sings at, some, at one point. Uh, I love guitar. It's got great guitar work. But, and the lyrics are amazing. But what really gets me emotional when I hear that song is at the end of the song, it's very celebratory. And it closes with the lyrics, uh, we're going to the house of God. We're going to the house of God. Are you coming? It's just in with inviting, come worship with us. And you can almost see, you know, people and, and, and children walking along behind them as they walk into the Lord's temple. It's just magnificent. And every time I hear it, I, I get a little tear because it's just so celebratory and powerful. You know, when we worship, we should worship with expectation. As Pastor Megan said uh, a, little, a little bit ago, you know, thank you, God, that we can be here today. When we gather for worship, we should expect God to do great things because we're going to the house of God. Amen. And our message should be, are you coming? Are you coming with me? Are you coming so that we can celebrate the Lord together? And we've been, I, I've been having a, a great time uh, teaching through the Songs of Ascent, uh, something I really haven't spent a lot of time in in my life, really is reflecting on what exactly they mean, what's their background, and how does it apply to us today. And so this morning we're going to be looking at uh, Psalm 132, and I would invite you uh, to turn there. But before I, before I read it, I have to mention, I sometimes, when I, when I preach, I, I will read the scripture, and I realize when I prepare my sermons, I usually do, I, I prepare it with my devotional Bible, which is an NIV, but it's a little bit older version of the NIV than my pulpit Bible. I, I, I preach with this one because it's lighter and it looks a little bit better than a big, you know, fat devotional Bible up here, and it fits better uh, on, on, this, on the stand. And so sometimes when I read out of my pulpit Bible, which is a little bit different, Literally, Sunday morning is the first time I've actually read it in this version of the NIV. And this morning, as I was reading through out of this Bible, I realized that the translation of it, I like a lot better than the one I prepared it with. So I, I want to bring that to your attention, because verse 1, I think really, I don't even know if I have to preach this morning. I can read verse 1 and then walk off the stage, but I'm not going to. But let me read what it says in the New International Revised Version that I have here. Lord, remember David in all his self-denial. My, my study Bible says in all his troubles. Self-denial, I think, is really cool here. A good way of interpreting what the psalm is actually saying. But I'll move on. He swore an oath to the Lord. He made a vow to the mighty one, to the mighty one of Jacob. I will not enter my house or go to my bed. I will allow no sleep to my eyes or slumber to my eyelids till I find a place for the Lord a dwelling for the mighty one of Jacob. We heard it in Ephrathah. We came upon it in the fields of Jaar. Let us go to his dwelling place. Let us worship at his footstool, saying, Arise, Lord, and come to your resting place, you and the ark of your might. May your priests be clothed with your righteousness. May your faithful people sing for joy. For the sake of your, of your servant David, do not reject your anointed one. The Lord swore an oath to David, a sure oath he will not revoke. One of your own descendants I will place on your throne if your sons keep my covenant 
and the statutes I teach them, then their sons will sit on your throne forever and ever. For the Lord has chosen Zion. He has desired it for his dwelling, saying, This is my resting place forever and ever. Here I will sit in throne, for I have desired it. I will bless her with abundant provisions. Her poor I will satisfy with food. I will clothe her priests with salvation, and her faithful people will ever sing for joy. Here I will make a horn grow for David, and set up a lamp for my anointed one. I will clothe his enemies with shame, but his head will be adorned with a radiant crown. One thing you'll notice about this psalm, as opposed to some of the others we've looked at, this one's a lot longer <laughs> than most of the other psalms of Ascent. It is. It is the longest of the songs of Ascent. But it has, and, and there's parts of it that as we read through it might seem confusing, and I hope that we can explain that this morning. But it is a, it is a wonderful song that is likely, they believe, written during David's lifetime. Probably not by David, because David was too humble to say, hey, remember David's self-denial. That wasn't really his style. It was probably written during David's lifetime, though, possibly for the express purpose of uh, when the temple was dedicated by King Solomon. It was a way of you know, saying, remember all that we've gone through to this point for the de dedication uh, of the temple. And the psalm describes David's passion for worship and also the promise that God made to David's family. We're not going to go through this verse by verse by verse, but I want to explain kind of three themes that we see, that we see in the different parts of this psalm. Verses 1 to 5, if I could encapsulate those verses, it would be about David's desire. Verses 1 through 5 are about David's desire, specifically David's desire to build a temple for the Lord. That's what the first five verses are about. And David had a passion that he wanted, not the, uh, the ark of the Lord, he did not want that to be in a tent. Instead, he wanted to have a temple, a glorious temple uh, that shone God's glory uh, where the worship of, of God could be in Jerusalem, the city that David had made the capital of Israel. And this was not simple religious zeal for David. It was personal. David's faith in God was deeply personal. As God himself said that David was a man after God's own heart. God had been with David during his life. God took David as a shepherd boy, the youngest of eight, of, of eight sons. God gave David victory over Goliath, a man much larger than David. And David yet had the confidence that God has helped me defeat the lion. He's helped me to defeat all these other animals that have attacked my flock. God has been with me then. He's going to be with me now. He was confident in the Lord. As uh, after God had anointed David to be the next king, David spent 10 years running from Saul to keep himself alive. There was times when David was depressed and lonely and when God was literally David's only friend that he had. It was personal for David. And now David is, in, uh, is the king and he loves the Lord and he loves worshiping the Lord. He wants other people to experience that and he wants to have a temple for the Lord. And a little bit about the story of that is found in 2 Samuel 7, verses 1 to 3, which says, After the king was settled in his palace and the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies around him, he said to Nathan the prophet, Here I am, living in a house of cedar, while the ark of God remains in a tent. Nathan replied to the king, Whatever you have in mind, go ahead and do it. For the Lord is with you. Do you hear the heart of David in that, in verse 2? Here I am. I'm this king. I have all these people at my disposal, all these buildings, in this lovely house made out of cedar, uh, immaculate, beautiful, and God's house is a tent. Not worthy of the glory of the God of Israel. And so you can hear what he wants to do. He wants to build a temple for the Lord. And if you read 2 Samuel 7, it goes on, and God speaks to the prophet Nathan and says, go tell David this. And what, what God says to Nathan to tell David is, it's wonderful that you want to build a house for me. 
But David, you've got a little bit too much warfare in your past, and I'm not a god of violence. I'm a god of peace, and so you're not going to be the one that builds the temple. Instead, your son Solomon will be the one that lays the foundation and that builds the temple. And I will bless Solomon. But then God also says, um, in verse 16, I'm going to do something for you, though, David. You're going to build... You're not going to be the one to build a house for me, but David, I'm going to build a house for you. He says, your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. God, there is prophesying that there will be somebody on the throne of David forever and ever. We'll get into that, who that is in just a few minutes. I think we know. We'll get into it. But David is humbled by this. And although he can't be the one that actually lays the foundation of the temple, for the rest of his life, David is making preparations so that basically all the instructions are there. So when Solomon takes over, he literally just has to follow the instructions that dad gave him. He gets the money for the temple. He gets the blueprints. He collects all the materials so that when Solomon takes over, he just has to build the temple. And apparently they even wrote some psalms for it during David's lifetime. So it was all ready. The worship order was ready. When Solomon becomes king. And in verses 3 through 5 of Psalm 132, we see David's passion there. I'm not going to enter my house or go to my bed. I will allow no sleep to my eyes or slumber to my eyelids till I find a place for the Lord and dwell for the mighty one of Jacob. I am not going to rest until God has his house. Because God is worthy of it. David had a passion, a desire to build a temple for God. Moving on in the psalm, and we come to verses 6 through 9. And I would say that Psalm 6 through 9 uh, involves David's mission. In, in particular, uh, David's mission to bring the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem. Because during, my, during the first part of David's reign, the Ark of the Covenant was still not in Jerusalem. The Ark had been in the, in the tabernacle in the time of Moses until shortly before David became king. It lived in a tent from the time of Moses, and then that moved around through the desert as the people were wandering during those 40 years. Once they settled in the Promised Land, it went to a place called Bethel, and then Mizpah, and then Shiloh, and something terrible had happened just a few years before David became king. You see, there was a, a priest named Eli that was, he was a careless priest, who never really disciplined his sons, and his sons had no fear of or respect for the Lord. They never took God's law seriously, but they're the ones that were offering sacrifices in the temple. Can you imagine that? They were wicked, wicked young men. And the army of Israel was going into battle against the Philistines, and the wicked sons of Eli said, Hey, I have an idea. We're about to go into battle. Let's take the Ark of the Lord as kind of a magic luck, you know, a good luck charm into battle before us, and then we're guaranteed we're going to win if the Ark of the Covenant goes into battle with us. Well, what happens? If you read the story, Eli's sons get killed in the battle. The Philistines capture the Ark of the Covenant and take it away to their, to their home. God's not very happy about that, though. He sends a plague to the Philistines who eventually send it back to Israel but from that, the day that it came back to Israel uh, until David decided to bring it to Jerusalem, it was in a city called kiriath Jerim. I know I'm not pronouncing that right. But it was a, a town in the, in the area of Ephrathah, which is why in verse 6 it says, We heard it in Ephrathah. This is speaking about David's desire to bring it from Ephrathah, from kiriath Jerim, back to, Jeru or to Jerusalem, where God wanted to eventually build the temple of God. And it also mentions in verse uh, 6, it says, in the fields of, Jer of Jaar, it's thought that that's kind of an abbreviation for Jerim. All right, carry up Jerim. So we're, we've heard that the temple, that the ark of the Lord is there, and it's time to bring it to, back to Jerusalem. And so if you remember the, the story when David goes and he brings the ark of the Lord into Jerusalem, and he's dancing, and he's carrying on, and he's... You know, depending on how you interpret that, he might have been kind of in his underwear or in the tunic as he's dancing, and, and his wife is not very happy. He's like, you look like a fool. Remember David's response? 
I will become even more dignified than this in my worship for God. I don't care how silly I look. I am worshiping God with all of my heart. He was so excited, and he brought it to Mount Zion, where it stayed until Solomon, his son, eventually moved it to the temple uh, of God. And the temple itself was then built uh, on land that David had, per had purchased for that purpose. And that's described in 2 Samuel 24. But, but verses 6 to 9 is a song of praise, praising God and asking him to bless the people's worship as they gather around the Ark of the Covenant, which is now in Jerusalem, where David understood that God had decided to build his temple there uh, in Jerusalem. David didn't just want to build a temple, but he put, he put forth a lot of effort in order to make that happen. So we have David's desire in verses 1 to 5, and we have David's uh, mission, which is to centralize worship in Jerusalem in verses 6 through 9. But then the psalm turns a little bit, verses 10 through 18, and it's no longer about David's desire and David's mission. Instead, it's about God's promise, specifically about God's promise to put one of David's descendants on the throne forever. Now God's desire when he did this was that David's descendants would honor him. Always, but they didn't, did they? There were some kings that honored the Lord, but eventually many of them le uh, led Judah into idolatry. They led God's people away from worship of the Lord. So that the Lord's temple became, uh, it came, became run down, and King Josiah had to, to kind of restore it, but it still... Eventually, the people left the Lord. They forgot all about the Lord and what happened. Eventually, God said, you know what? For a while, there's not going to be any of David's descendants on the throne because I need to send the people into exile. Now, did God break his promise? Absolutely not. When I was in math class, you know, I learned that a ray goes on forever. You know, that a line, there's a line, there's a line segment, but the ray goes on forever. So even if there's a break... <laughs> In God's fulfillment there of the promise, as long as there's somebody eventually that comes on the throne and reigns forever, guess what? God has kept his promise, and he's done that through Jesus Christ. You see, verses 10 through, describe, through 18 describe the, the oath that, that was sworn to David, the one of your own descendants I will place on your throne. And later on, he says, I will make a horn grow for David and set up a lamp for my anointed one. I will clothe his enemies with shame, but his head will be adorned with a radiant crown. This is a promise about someone coming through David's family who will reign on God's throne forever and ever. Not merely a human ruler, but God himself would live in Zion. On that hill we've talked about that's part of Jerusalem, this refers to the Messiah. God would bless his people. There would be no poor among them, no corruption, but salvation would come. It would be eternal. It would last forever. Verse 17 uses a couple of analogies. It says, I will make a horn grow. Now, whenever you see horn in, in Old Testament scripture, horn represents power. Just think of a bull. Who wants to be on the uh, business end of the bull's horn? Anybody? <laughs> a bull is power. That wasn't very nice. <laughs> She just gored her mother. <laughs> no, a, a horn represents power and strength. And so when God says, I will make a horn grow, he's saying that there will be strength through David's line, through this Messiah that will come. Not just a horn, but he says then that there will also be a lamp. Now, what's the significance of a lamp? Think of an oil lamp that lasts forever. Olive oil that burns forever. There will be length. There will be eternity to his kingdom. Power and eternity will be the, uh, of the descendant of David that will take control of the throne. And the, uh, so David here in this song of ascent is, is encouraging the people of Jerusalem, encouraging the people of Israel to long for the day, the same way David does, when this promise is made true and where the Messiah will reign forever. And in Jesus' day, one of the reasons that the, that the uh, teachers and the Pharisees were so nervous about Jesus was because people were beginning to realize that Jesus is the one that may be fulfilling this promise. Because every time there was a pilgrimage to Jerusalem, people were encouraged to long for the days of the Messiah. And so people were saying, is Jesus the Messiah? Yes, he absolutely was. The Jewish leaders didn't see it. They didn't understand it. 
that Jesus was the one that fulfilled these promises. The principle, and I, I think we're in agreement of this this morning, I don't think this is new knowledge to us, but the principle this morning is that Jesus Christ is our King, amen? amen. Jesus is the one that fulfills this psalm, that fulfills these promises. He is the horn, the strength of David. He is the lamp that burns before the Lord, the light of the world. And we're told in Scripture that every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is King of kings and Lord of lords. God has fulfilled his promise through Jesus Christ. And the day is coming when he will come and reign on the earth forever. I had to run some errands with Eva and Aaron yesterday morning. And as we were driving out of out of New Paris, I looked at the eastern sky, and I don't know if anybody happened to look east about 10 o'clock yesterday morning, but there were these kind of light, like a, a lot of very small clouds just in the eastern distance, and I had to, I told the kids, I said, that's what the, I imagine the sky would look like when Christ comes back. Just beautiful, just some very beautiful little clouds uh, along the horizon. It just got me thinking about the fact we have a returning king, Amen. We can look forward to that promise. Every promise of God is going to be fulfilled. He made, he made a promise to bring a descendant from, from David's line, which was Jesus. He made, a, he made promises that he would die for the sins of his people, which he did. He made promises that he would be raised to new life, which occurred. He made promises that Christ would ascend into heaven, the right hand of the Father, which has happened. And he's promised that he's coming back to the earth to reign forever. We have that promise through Jesus Christ the Lord. So what are we going to do with that knowledge? That's the point of today's message. Matthew 6.33. We looked at this a few months ago. It's a good one, though, so we'll look at it again. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. That's what Jesus said. Seek first the kingdom of God. What we see in David's life, and what we see in Psalm 132, is that David put the kingdom of God first. I just lost my water. There we go. That the kingdom of God is what David was focused on, which is why he wanted to centralize worship in Jerusalem. Why he set aside Zion as the, as the mountain of God, realizing that one day his descendant was going to reign on the earth from this spot. He put the kingdom of God first. He, he, talked, he, built, he wanted to build a temple. What he really wanted was the, the reign of Jesus Christ. He sought the kingdom, and that strive, that caused him to strive greatly. My question for us this morning, my question is, are we seeking God's kingdom with the same passion that Jesus did, or excuse me, that David did? Are we seeking God's kingdom with the same passion that David did? And what will we do to see the kingdom of God advance? I love in Psalm 132, David says, I won't let any rest come to my eyes. There's some that actually speculate that David didn't sleep in his bedroom the rest of his life. Because that, that, would, that can be taken literally. Well, I will not go into my chamber until I have a place for God. He was so passionate about seeing the house of God built. How passionate are we about seeing the kingdom of God built? Now, we could do a lot of things in response to that. I just want to focus on one thing this morning, because I think, you know, tackling the entire world seems like a pretty big uh, mission for us right now. But I want us to focus on one thing. Pastor Megan read these verses earlier, but I want to read them again. Luke 10, 1 to 2. After this, the Lord, that is, Jesus appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to go to every town and place where he was about to go. He told them the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers in his harvest field. Our, my encouragement to us today, putting God's kingdom first, is let's pray that God will equip us in the harvest field. Let's pray that God will raise up a new generation of leaders to be our pastors, to be our, our missionaries, to be our evangelists. And does anybody agree that we need Jesus right now in our nation? Have we seen more evidence of exactly how far we've strayed from God's commands as in the last few months? We need a fresh revival of Jesus Christ, and we need people 
to be the ones that, that share that message. We need people that are able to say, we're, come, we're going to the house of God. Are you coming with us? Because let me tell you, that's a journey you want to make. It's worth the travel. It's worth the journey to go and worship the Lord. So come with me. Can we pray that God will raise up leaders, that God will equip us and use us in our everyday conversations, at work, in our families, and in our neighborhoods, to be able to share the gospel with others? Will you join me in prayer as we do that? Father David said he would not allow any slumber to come to his eyelids, that he would not rest until he saw you glorified, until he saw his people worshiping you in a temple. And Lord, we don't need to build a temple. We are the temple where God lives by his Holy Spirit. We don't need to bring the Ark of the Covenant to a certain place as David did. It's not important anymore because, because you are the Ark within us. We have your Spirit. Our, your presence is in us and with us. And we proclaim to people that they can experience the presence of God when they put their faith in Jesus Christ. We don't need an Ark and we don't need a temple anymore. But we still want to see you glorified. We still want to see people worshiping you with salvation and faith. We want to see people come to faith and experience your grace and the eternal life that you have for everybody because you, you don't desire that anyone would perish, but you want all to come to repentance. And Lord, this is no secret. This has been a difficult year. Ministry has been hard. It's been, uh, it's been difficult to know how we can worship in one place, but, but how we can reach out to others. At a time when we're told to social distance. At a time when uh, even when we're together, we can't embrace each other the way we want. At a time when our love for one another, our, our affection and the way that we encourage one another and embrace one another is a characteristic of who we are. And it's been hard to do that and to share that with others. Give us, Lord, the Wisdom to know how we can reach others because we want people to come with us to the house of God. We want all people to experience salvation. And Lord, I pray that in this church and other churches in our area and our nation, may you raise up a generation of revivalists, of evangelists. May you raise up a generation of pastors, of, of, of people that can show compassion to others and that can well explain who Jesus is, why his message is important, why it needs to resonate in their hearts, and that, Lord, you would turn people to you. You would work in the hearts of people all across this nation. They would understand that there's sinners who need a Savior and that there's life available, that you would transform lives and families and communities. And the Lord, although we've gone through like David's kingdom was a, a kingdom he experienced, a lot of violence, a lot of bloodshed, we're experiencing that now. Lord, it is your desire to be a God of peace, that there can be peace and blessing for us as we turn to you. We focus on rebuilding the ministries that you've called us to. So Lord, we pray for this. And we're confident that you're going to bring it to pass. Because it is your desire that people come to Christ. Help us to be faithful. Uh, Lord, uh, start a new work within us and lead us to your salvation. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. stand as we sing How Great Thou Art. How Great Thou I hear the rolling